Turn with me to the book of Philemon. We uh, started a series last week, if you weren't here on this book, it's a very small book. Matter of fact, if you are not careful, you'll go right past it. It's only usually a page in your Bible, and it's, uh, it's one of the smallest books in the Bible. It's actually a postscript to the book of Colossians. That's why if you collect commentaries or get commentaries on the Bible, that's why Titus, Titus and Colossians are together, even though they're, um, I mean, Colossians and, and uh, Philemon are together, even though it follows Titus, because it's a postscript to that letter. And we talked about it's written to a nobleman who was a slave master. He had slaves. Now, before you flip out, we're going to talk about slaves today. When this letter was written, one-fifth of the Roman Empire was slaves. One-fifth. It was about 12 million slaves, and there were different types. There were some slaves that were sold and bought. There were some slaves that we talked about that needed help or needed support, so they would go to someone say, I would like to become your servant, your slave, and they would be a slave for a year or two as they paid things off or supported their family. Sometimes those slaves were abused and mistreated and often killed. They didn't have rights. They couldn't own property. Then there were other slaves that were part of the family, so much so they were cared for as family. Slavery in Rome was part of their economic system. And it was dominant during that time. And so we're going to look at slavery because of some things that's kind of being laid against Christianity for passages like this and other passages. So let's go to Lord in prayer, and then we're going to jump right into God's Word. Let's pray. Father, everything in your word is for our faith to build it up, to help us to live life as you instruct us to, even passages like this. And I pray we not be like the rest of the world that hardens our hearts and our minds to not understand. Father, there's a war on truth. If we don't like what we hear, we just dismiss it instead of examining ourselves and realizing some great things that we need to do. It's easier to go passive than to deal with things in our life. So Father, I pray that you would open our ears to hear what the Spirit is saying, that you would give us something from this message to hold on to, not just today and this week, but for the rest of our life. And only the Holy Spirit can do that in us. So we're asking that he would do a work this morning in church, in our life. Let us be listening for us and not for others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Do you all know what I mean when I say don't listen for others? We do that. Man, I wish Marcia was here today. She needed to hear that. It's listening for others. Let's look at uh, verse 8. Paul is talking to Philemon. We, talked, we did our intro last week, but verse 8 is Paul talking to him. It says, Therefore, though I might be very bold in Christ to command you what is fitting, yet for love's sake I rather appeal to you, being such a one as Paul, the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who I've begotten while in my chains, who once was unprofitable to you, but now is profitable to you and to me. And what Paul's doing there is he's talking to Philemon, who he led to Christ on a mission journey. And now, much later, he's in Rome, he's a prisoner, and he's witnessing to a slave. He comes to Christ. And Paul had a divine appointment and realized these two are tied together. Onesimus has been very helpful to him. And Paul could write back and say, I command you as an apostle of Jesus Christ to do this for me. But he doesn't do that. He says, I want to appeal to you in love. Look at verse 12. I'm sending him back to you, therefore, to receive him. That is my own heart. Paul's saying, I love Onesimus. 
whom I wish to keep with me. If it was my will, I'd, I'd let him stay here. But he says, that on your behalf he might minister to me in chains for the gospel. But without your consent, I wanted to do nothing. That your good deed might not be by compulsion, as it were, but voluntary. For perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose, that you might receive him forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in flesh and in the Lord. Paul is sending a slave back to his master. He could have kept him there. He wanted to keep him there, but he said, I want to do the right thing. He's yours. What I mean by that is Onesimus is your property. He's your slave. Now, in the last couple of years, atheists, colleges, the intelligentsia, if you will, has leveled an attack on Christianity that sadly most Christians don't even know how to answer strictly because we don't study the Bible like we used to. And here's the attack. You ready? God endorses and condones slavery. What would y'all say to that? He does in the law of God. He tells you how to treat your slaves. Paul sends this guy back to his master. That seems like he's condoning it, doesn't it? He's referring to him as yours, kind of, if you will. There's other places in the New Testament that tells you how to treat your slaves. Sounds like condoning slavery to me. Argue back with me. How would you defend that? You can't. Except if you know your Bible. God doesn't condone slavery. Just like he doesn't condone abuse. Just like he doesn't condone unfaithfulness in a marriage. Just like he doesn't condone the abuse of children. But there's places in God's word where he speaks against it. If you harm a child, this is what Jesus says of you. You who hurts one of these little ones or cause them to stumble, it'd be better for you to have a millstone tied around your neck and dropped into the sea. And if he was speaking today, he would say this. I'm just saying. <laughs> so we know where God stands on that. Jesus said, look, from the very beginning, it wasn't this way. It was one man and one woman. But because your hard-heartedness, he's allowed you to write a certificate of divorce. But it wasn't that way from the beginning. Is God condoning that? Or is he allowing that? Or is he giving us an option because of our sinfulness? What he's doing is he's addressing the issues in life that we have to help us learn to live it out. And so when he says to slaves, slaves, do this for your masters, he's doing it for the sake of the gospel. When he says, do your work as unto the Lord and not for eye service, he's saying, as a Christian slave, act this way. As a Christian husband, act this way. As a Christian wife, act this way. Let me give you some things to think about that our kids are dealing with in school. Here's some, here's some titles I came across this, this week, and I've gotten in some arguments on Facebook over this stuff. Religion is the fundamental development of both slavery and race issues in the Protestant Atlantic world. Is that true? No, it's not, but they're promoting that. Um, heard a Harvard person talk about this. I thought this was great. Um, talking about our last administration. White Christian nationalism. That's how they referred to the previous administration. White Christian nationalism promotes race issues and white nationalism, racism, and slavery. Here's another one. The relationship between Christianity and slavery is undeniable. It promoted and often endorsed it. Now, there, our kids have been brought up in a program of education, parents, that you need to be very aware of. They are not taught how to think. 
They are not taught how to do critical thinking. They are not taught how to do problem solving. They are taught to take in information and regurgitate it. They're not taught how to think. They're taught what to think. And then they go off to these colleges and they're programmed. Because the Bible doesn't teach this at all. Let me say that again. The Bible does not teach this at all. Matter of fact, in Exodus 21, 16, it says, anyone who kidnaps another and sells him into slavery must be put to death. Does that sound like it's promoting slavery? No. The Bible's core ethic is summarized in this. Do unto others what? as you would have them do unto you. Love your neighbor as it calls us to treat one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. As a matter of fact, in this letter, Paul even says this. He's no longer now your slave. He's now your brother. It was a changing in a paradigm. And it actually impacted the way slaves were in Rome. Christianity impacted the way slavery was in Europe and in America. No historian that looks at historical records can ever deny that it was Christianity that fought against slavery. Why? Why would Christianity fight against slavery where other religions were not? Because everyone is created in the image of wonderfully and fearfully made. And God talks about all these things. There's this new vision for humanity after Christ died and raised from the dead. In Christ, masters and servants become brothers and sisters in Christ. There's a scholar. Our young people, y'all are never going to read these people in college anymore. Frederick Douglass. Y'all heard of him? Okay. No one reads him anymore. Here's another one. Thomas Sewell. He's African-American. He wrote a massive three-volume set on slavery. He points out this that slavery was universal. The terrible European slave trade affected and trafficked 11 million Africans. But twice as many were bought and sold on the, uh, the Arabian Peninsula during that same time period. Furthermore, he says, almost every slave sold to the European slave trade were enslaved and sold to them by other Africans. So in other words, slavery was a universal problem. However, the amount of literature coming out against slavery was coming out from the West, not Arabia. The efforts to stop slavery came from the West, talking about the Christianized West. He said because slavery being universal was stopped because of things like the Great Awakening, preaching by John and Charles Wesley, the reforms of Christian statesmen like William Wilberforce. They had a movie made about William Wilberforce. He spent his whole life fighting it. Why? Because he was convicted it went against God's word and what God had, had done. Now listen, there were people that abused the scriptures, but people abused the scriptures all the time. There was people that said Noah's son was cursed and he was going to be a slave to everyone. And that was, his son was cursed, and his skin turned black, and that's where black people came from, and they were supposed to be slaves. There's people that preached that. But they were abusing the what? They didn't even track where those people went. They didn't study the Bible, and people just heard it and said, must be what? True. There's people that abused the Bible to promote communism. You will not find that in the Bible. There's people that use it to promote capitalism. Ladies, there's people that abuse this Bible to get you to be a doormat. The number one quoted verse by men. All the women went, I'll tell you what it is. <laughs> what is it, ladies? Why submit to your husbands? There's a couple verses above that they don't quote. Submit one, two. So... Just because somebody abused Scripture doesn't mean Scripture's endorsing it. The gospel plants a seed that's undoing a broken system in our world. There's always been hypocrites, not just in Christianity, but Islam and everything else, Buddhism. So I had somebody tell me this this week. I met with them, and I loved them dearly. 
They said, you know, I don't go to church because of the hypocrites. I hear that all the time. And listen, there's some truth to that. But this is what I said. Well, I don't go. I'm not going to the gym because there's fat people there. <laughs> kind of hypocritical, isn't it, Frankie? If you're at the gym, you should be fit and in shape. But no, listen, church is where broken, sinful, hypocritical, slander gossips need to go in order that we can stop being those things, that we can become more like who? Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul is doing here. I want to read this to you. When Paul says, I could command you to do what I required he could drop the apostle bomb and order him around, but rather he pressed the gospel into the heart. And he says, I want you to obey out of love because real change, real transformation comes by love, not by being berated by the law. That kind of change is permanent. It's beautiful, and it leads to a godly world. I want to change because I love them. I want to change and be obedient because I love God. And that's how Paul addresses it. The New Testament subverts the entire premise of slavery except for one. Only one. Everybody in this room, the Bible says, is a slave. Did you know that? This is the only forms of slavery the Bible promotes and endorses. The Bible says that if you're separated from Christ, you don't have the Holy Spirit in you, you're not born again, if you will, you haven't been transformed, you're a slave to sin, which means you're going to live selfishly, self-centeredly, looking for self at all times. You can't help it. You're a slave to it. And the word that they use for slave is a word that he also uses for Christians. It's the word doulos. Let me, let me just read it to you. In Romans 6, it says, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lust. And do not present your members or your body parts or your your person as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and that your members as instruments of righteousness to God for sin shall have no dominion over you for you are not under law, but under grace. What then shall we sin because we're not under law, but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that whom you present yourselves slaves to obey you are that one slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness. Let me break that down for you. How many of y'all ever lost your temper and said something you shouldn't have said? <laughs> All right. God calls us, he says, look, in your anger, don't what? Sin. But when all those buttons have been pushed and you let it go, are you in control anymore? You're a slave to what? Guys, we struggle different than the ladies. And listen, I'm talking to so many young people now, I'm a little worried about what's going on. Uh, we struggle with our eyes. Would you agree? Y'all know what I'm saying? Listen to what I hear my guys saying. I don't want to, but I can't help him. He's a slave to what? He's, he can't even say what? No. See, slaves aren't allowed to say no. What happens if a slave says no? Punished or beat. They're made to submit and obey through what? Force or fear. And that's what he's saying. Don't be a slave to sin. Verse 16 in Romans 6 says this, Do you not know whom you present yourself slaves to obey? You're that one slave. And then verse 17 says, But God, be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine 
of which you were delivered. We were delivered out of that slavery. Verse 18, and having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanliness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now therefore present your members as righteousness for holiness. So listen, the more that we obey, the more we become a slave to what? Righteousness, because we understand how it works. I tell the truth, I don't lie, I get a clear conscience, I kind of like the way that feels, and so I become a slave to righteousness. I purpose to tell the truth all the time now. That's a slave of righteousness. But I can slip back as a Christian, we call that backsliding, I know some people don't agree with it, but it's biblical, you can find it. We can give in to the old man in sin and lie, and what happens? We become a... So you're either a slave of righteousness or a slave of sin. Every one of us, we're a slave to the one we what? Obey. Jesus said this, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin because we obey it. Now, I'm going to drive this point home. You ready? When we give our life to Jesus Christ, when we recognize that we are self-centered and selfish and we live for self, God refers to that condition as sin. We have a sin condition. And we see all the selfish acts we've done and all the things that it has brought about. It leads to destruction and death in relationships, emotionally, mentally. And we put our faith in what Christ has done, not just to receive forgiveness of our sin, but to be set free from that sin condition. And he puts his spirit in us, so now that we're, not, we're no longer slaves to sin, now we have something inside of us stronger than that, so we can choose who we're going to what? We do. You may not believe that. This is what the Bible teaches. Choose this day whom you're going to serve. If I obey sin, I'm a slave to what? Sin. If I'm, a, if I'm obedient to the truth that I see, then I'm a slave to righteousness. One leads to death, one leads to life. And I put my faith in Christ. He gives me a name. It's a Greek name. Your Bible's loaded with it. You ready? Y'all have heard it. Some of you have. It's doulos. But let me tell you something I figured out. And some other people have figured this out too. I never knew it. I didn't put the pieces together. I saw it. I just didn't put the pieces together. When Paul says in Romans 1, when he's writing a letter, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, called to be a bondservant, that word is doulos. Doulos means slave. He's saying, I'm called to be a slave of Christ. Peter, in 2 Peter. Peter, a servant of Jesus Christ. It's doulos. The word is what? Slave. The book of Jude. Slave. Book of Revelation, written to the servants of Christ. It's the word doulos. It means what? In the book of Acts, 92 times, referring to Christ, it's referred to as Lord. And two times, it's referred to, he's, he's referred to as Savior. 92 times, Lord. Two times as Savior. What word do we use more for Jesus Christ? Savior or Lord when we're talking? Savior. There was a shift in church history. I'm reading from the early apostolic fathers up to the Reformation. I've read a boatload on Reformation and later. I haven't read a whole lot there. Do you know the term that the early church used for Christians? Slave of Jesus Christ. So you go through history, and when you get to Europe in the West, something happens. They change that word slave to servant. 300 times in the Old Testament, slave is used as a noun. 300 times it's used as a verb. There's over 800 uses of that word slave, and the King James translates the word slave out of all those words only. So today is Reformation Day. Did y'all know that? The Great Reformation. 
where the Protestant churches were born, they, they printed their own Bible. Guess how they translated it? Servant. Now, there was other Bibles that translated it slave. But the Reformers didn't do it. John Knox didn't do it. Wycliffe didn't do it. But the early church fathers did. Let me ask you a question, church. The Russians didn't do it. The Orthodox Church didn't do it. They also used another word instead of um, immersion. The Reformers and King James. Do you know why? They're coming out of the Catholic tradition and they didn't want to rock the boat too much, so they just used the word called baptism. That was a good, safe word. But the word is actually immersion, which means you're buried under the water and brought up. Why did they use baptism and servant? It was too much political baggage. And so they changed it. Now, what does that have to do, Larry? That's great. Uh, that's great information. Listen, when we give our life to Christ, I want you to think about this for a second. The way we're saved, it says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Jude 4 says this about Jesus Christ. I'm going to read you. I'm going to show you the, the, the changes. You ready? So all the translations after this just changed some things. You can look all this stuff up. Jude verse 4, it says, For there are certain men who crept in, which were before old ordained to this condemnation. They're ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into wantonness and deny God, the only Lord, and our Lord Jesus Christ. New American Standard, which is a great translation, but listen how they translate it. For certain people have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into an indecent behavior and deny, ready? Our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. The Amplified Bible, which I encourage. They use the term Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. We need some cars out here today, so I'm asking for servants. Can I get a volunteer to help? That gives you all some what? Hmm. I don't know, the game's coming on. You pick which one's going to be best. What we kind of do is we use our will and our desires and our wants to determine the situation whether I'm going to serve or not. But what if I was your master and you're my slaves? Now, listen, I kind of like that. <laughs> See, I don't have to ask then, do I? I go, Jason, I need you and your wife here at 3 o'clock. And if you're a slave, what do you have to say, Jason? Now, he may say it out of fear. He may say it because of punishment. But he's going to say, because a slave doesn't have an option. In the book of Jude, that verse in the New King James, I believe, says, some use the grace of God as a license for immorality. And then he follows up with master. He doesn't use it in the King James, doesn't have it in the New King James, doesn't have it, but in the Greek, it's master and Lord. What it's saying is, we as Christians, when we give our life to Christ, our relationship to Christ changes. He is now our Lord. He's in charge. He's the sovereign one. He's the king. And when the king speaks, the subjects say what? Yes, sire. Yes, my Lord. Yes, I will. That's the only form of slavery that's endorsed in your Bible. God used what was going on in the Roman world to show a picture of how we're supposed to be relating to Christ. Our life is often defined by our wills and our wants and our desires. 
but he wants it defined by Christ and his will and his desires. And that's where the rub is. That's what we struggle with. I love Jesus, my Savior, but I don't want to be a do loss. If he says, go forgive this person, I don't want to have to do that. I want a choice in the matter. But if he's really our Lord and master, if you will, then what are we supposed to do? Not my will be done, but your will be done. The invitation that the Lord Jesus Christ gives us is kind of heavy. Listen, if anyone wishes to follow me as my disciple, he must deny himself, that is to set aside selfish interest, and take up his cross daily, expressing a willingness to endure whatever may come, and to follow me, believing in me and conforming to my example and living, and if need be, suffering, and maybe even perhaps dying because of faith in me. That's Luke 9, 23. See, a slave was bought. Master would either take care of that slave or abuse him. If it was a good master, he would protect them or he would expose them if he was a bad one. A good master would show compassion, a bad one tyranny. A good master would encourage their slave, or if he was psychopathic, he'd harass him and abuse him. A good master would build that slave up. A bad one would tear him down. So the type of slavery you were in depended a lot on which master you were what? Serving. And so that's why Jesus says this. This is my commandment to you. I'm reading from the Amplified Bible. This is from John 15. This is my commandment to you. Love and unselfishly seek the best of one another, just as I have loved you. No one has greater love or stronger commitment than to lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you keep doing what I command you. I do not call you doulas. It's slaves. That's what that word means. I do not call you slaves any longer. For the servant does not know, or the slave does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you my friends because I have revealed to you everything that I have heard from my Father. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and I have appointed you and placed and purposely planted you so that you would go and bear fruit and keep on bearing fruit and that your fruit will remain and be lasting so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name as my representative, he may give it to you. This is what I command you, that you love and unselfishly seek the best for one another. When Jesus tells us to follow him, he says, I want you to take up your cross. I want you to deny yourself. I want you to die to yourself. I want you to live for me, my life for your life. You were bought with a price. You're now mine. And he calls us and refers to us as doulos. We are now slaves of Jesus Christ. But in this passage, he's telling us what kind of master he is. You know what I found everybody's looking for? I don't care if they're 13 years old or 80. You know what everybody's looking for? Love. They're looking for somebody that genuinely knows them and gets them and understands them and loves them anyway. Who is there for them to hear them and to help build them up, and to become everything they can be, and also call them on things in a loving way to make them become better by getting things out of their life. They want somebody that they feel so safe with and totally trust they can share every secret they've ever had. The first person they think of in a moment of celebration is that friend. I can't wait to tell so-and-so. Most of y'all don't even wait. You call. 
My daughters FaceTime me sometime over the silliest stuff. Hey, Dad, come here, let me show you something. They're at Walmart. I'm hoping they're doing that because they feel what with me? Safe. Every man, woman, and child on this planet is looking for somebody that totally understands them and gets them and loves them any way. And if we could feel safe enough, this is what I figured out in counseling. If people feel safe enough with you, they will share what with you? Everything. And what Jesus is saying is, I bought you. You are now mine. Your life is no longer yours. You're living for me. But you're not just my slave. You're my, say it, friend. I wonderfully and fearfully made you. I know why you struggle with that sin. You don't, but I do. I know why you have to be so defensive all the time. Nobody else knows, but I know. And all he wants is that relationship where we're reciprocating back and forth. David, he referred to David as what? A man after my own heart. Man, I'd love to have that title. See, many of us want to hear this. Well done, good and faithful servant. I would trade that for this. You were a good friend. Because I'm a good friend and I love him, guess what I'm going to do naturally? Well done, good and faithful servant. I wonder if that well done, good and faithful servant is due loss. Look that up when you get home. Well done, good and faithful slave. But the master we serve is a good master. And I want to be like David that says, all right, if you know why I'm struggling... Search me and know me and reveal to me any way in me. And God sees that we're really praying that. He goes, I'm going to show you what it is, son. This is what it is. Now I need you to stop doing this. Yes, Lord. You've been going around slandering people. I've been convicting you about it. You're not stopping it. Stop it. Can you say no, Lord? Because if you do, he's not your you're not a slave to him anymore. You're a slave to, say it, sin. The only slavery the Bible endorses is our relationship with him. Does that make sense? So as we leave here today, I hope you'll re-examine your relationship and say, hey, am I acting as a slave? Yes, Master and Lord, or am I just kind of in this for what he's going to do for we're to be following him. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we all struggle with that. We all struggle with dying to ourself. We all struggle with taking up our cross. We all struggle doing what you ask us to do. And Father, I pray that you would help each one of us to have a heart that pursues you as a friend. As a friend who says, yes, Lord, and recognizes that we have been bought with a tremendous price, the life of your son. That you loved us so much that you gave it all. So Father, help us to love you so much we give it all for you and your kingdom. Help us to die to ourself. Help us to be in right relationship with you. Help us to act out of love. Forgive us for being so self-serving in our relationship with you. Let it be all about you and your will be done. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, amen.